Hey everybody, it's Tom Ballator again, this time with a walkthrough for PSET 2. For those of you who are struggling with this problem set and just don't know what to do. Um, I think it's interesting if you look at the forum, you can see sort of a marked decrease, I think, in the number of questions regarding this problem set than there were with problem set 1. There's a number of reasons for that. For example, the difficulty, I think, of problem set 2 might be a little bit less than problem set 1. That's debatable. Another reason could be that you're just simply getting better at coding. The things you learned in problem set one, loops, iterating, you know, conditionals, those sorts of things, all come into play here and you've already got them in your toolbox based on the work you've already done. That's probably one of the main reasons. Another reason, I hope it's not the main reason, but it may be, is the survivor effect, what I'm calling. A lot of people have probably dropped out or just given up after they saw PSET one and realized they couldn't do it. So. You've hung in there, you've made it this far, you're sticking it out, good for you. And this is a little bit of help if you just can't quite get over that last hurdle with PSET 2. I thought, I I thought what I would do is first start with uh, some general hints and then dive into um, a few more specific things for each problem. So hint number one, you only need the material from lesson three. You know, the way the course is set up, it's got lesson three, lesson four, and then problem set two. So a lot of people, I think, feel that they have to use the material from lesson four to solve the questions in problem set two. That is absolutely not the case. You're going to have to use the stuff in lesson four on functions and recursion later on, especially on the quiz, which is coming up. But right now, you don't need it. In fact, if you're not very used to programming, then you know trying to do a recursive solution to one of these problems is really going to make it difficult. So you don't need that at this point. Don't look at Stack Exchange. That's my second hint, and maybe the most important one. I have people coming. To, I have people coming to me with code, and they're using. They don't know how to do very simple things. Declare a variable, but they're calling libraries. It's really strange, and you can tell immediately that they've gotten this solution from someone who's an expert programmer who doesn't know this is an entry level class. Then they shouldn't know how to do those things yet. So be careful with that. Um, another thing is that you should see all three of these problems as connected. Again, I've had people sending me code in which they think problems one, two, and three are somehow different. Well, they are different, but they're just birds of a feather. And some of those birds have finer plumage as you get down to the peacock of number three. Uh, the first one's really simple. The second one is in the middle, and the third one is hard. But they're really all the same problem, just a few extra things stuck onto each one as you go along. So with those hints in mind, let's look at each problem in a little bit more detail. Problem one is straightforward. It's simply if you have an initial balance on your credit card, and you've got 12 months, and you pay the minimum each month, how much is your balance at the end of that year? Um, all the answers you need here are included in the problem statement and also if you look at this introduction statement the thing I did was I just looked through here at this table and figured how would I code this if we've got an initial balance that the grader is going to give us how would you calculate minimum payment well that's easy that's the balance times this minimum payment rate monthly payment rate um, you've got a hundred so after you pay a hundred dollars you've got four thousand nine hundred left um, that's simply the balance minus the minimum payment. Um, how do you calculate the interest? Well, that's simply the unpaid balance times the annual interest rate divided by 12, which is the month number of months in a year, times the unpaid balance, which I think I said. And then what are you going to have to pay in the next month? What's your balance going to be? Well, it's going to be the unpaid balance plus the interest you owe. And then you go through the same thing again 12 times. So you know you're going to have to have a loop in here, a loop that goes through this 12 times. Um, some other advice, though, I think it's important that you have good variable names. People have been coming to me with um, names that, you know, it's really hard to tell what they are, and I think they get confused too. If you look here in the statement, the, the problem itself is calling the annual interest rate annual interest rate. That might be a bit verbose. Some people are using AIR instead. Eh, yeah, you can save a little space, I suppose, but in a year from now when you're looking at this, or in a week from now and you're thinking, what's AIR? What's MPR? Mm, it's not gonna, you're not gonna remember it unless you write monthly payment rate using this camel case. 
So it's just keep the names um, straightforward like that at this point. Another point is I think people were having trouble at the end after they go through a loop and calculate this, even if they get it right, they were having trouble printing out the correct answer for the grader. And the grader is very picky about spaces, capitals, everything like that. So let's take a quick look here at Spider. And I'll show you two ways of printing out the answers. Let's say we've got a balance. Um, and let's say it's equal to oh, just 3,000 for sake of argument. Let's say we want to print that out. There's two ways of doing this. You can take print, parentheses, and then let's say balance is end quote, comma, and then the variable balance itself. If you run that, you should see balance is 3,000. That's nice. Another way, people, a lot of people were trying to turn this balance variable into a string and concatenate it onto this first part. And that's fine, you can do that. Um, let me do this one more time. Balance is, and then instead of a comma here, have a plus, and then you're gonna have to, excuse me, um, cast this variable balance, which is an integer, as a string. And if you do that, you get the answer. You'll notice that there's no space between is and three thousand the way this works. So you'll have to put a space in there and get the answer. And that'll be the same. I prefer this, this approach because I just think it's easier. You don't need to cast it. And Python's just fine with handling that. So that's problem one. Problem two is a great problem, I think for a couple reasons. First, it expands on what we saw in problem one. In that case, you are just paying the bare minimum and you're gonna end up with a balance at the end of the year, undoubtedly. Problem two takes you a financially smarter step forward and says how much you have to pay in each month over 12 months to put that credit card balance from its original value down to zero or less than zero in this case. And to do that, um, you're gonna have to make some guesses. Um, this is basically a guess and check algorithm. And the great thing about it is it's, it's the, really the dumb one. It's kind of like the kid in the back of the car who keeps saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yeah, you know, you're gonna get there, and when you are there, the answer is gonna be yes, we are there, son. Just be quiet. But until you get there, it's really painful for everyone else. This method is the same. You know, it's if you look through the uh, the code itself, or the not the code, I'm sorry. If you look through the recommended um, things here, it says monthly payment must be multiple of ten. So that's a big hint there. You're taking steps of 10 with your guesses. A great first guess is just simply zero. Let's say you're not gonna pay anything. You know you're not gonna achieve a balance of zero or less than zero if you're not paying anything with a non-zero starting balance, but it gets you going. And so once you do that and you've trusted zero, add on 10, do it again. If that's not enough, add on another 10, you got 20. If that's not enough, add on another 10 and keep going until your balance gets to zero. So it's really that while your balance is greater than zero, you gotta keep looping through that. The one tricky thing about this problem is to realize that that balance, small b word, that you're being fed from the grader is one thing, and then the balance that you're gonna be doing and calculating in your loops is gonna be based on that, but it's always gonna be changing. And sometimes, you know, when your loop excuse me, when your iteration or your, your guess at the minimum monthly balance isn't correct, you're going to have to somehow reset whatever you were using for balance in your loops. So remember that one variable balance itself doesn't have to bear all that burden. You can have another variable, some sort of proxy for balance, whatever, balance two, balance temp, whatever you want to call it, that's going to be something that you can easily reset as you're going through those loops. Okay. So hopefully that gives you some ideas about how to do problem two. I love problem three. It's because it's smart guess and check. It's a really nice augmentation of the previous one, which really wasn't too smart. If you think about that kid in the car I was talking about, you know, his father's so fed up with his questions. He's like, hey, take that dictionary and look up Python for me, would you? Kid says, okay. And he's not so bright, so he's gonna start at the A's. Aardvark, uh, abacus, abandon, uh, abattoir, abbey, abbreviate. Uh, it's going to take a very long time for him to get to the P's in Python. 
His sister next to him, she's smart. She's going to say, give me that dictionary. And she's going to open it up right to the middle. M, metal, those meddling kids. And she knows that Python P comes after M, so she's going to take that remaining part, divide that in half, and what do you get? Rummage sale. Huh, that's a funny one. But rummage sale comes after Python, so take that remaining part right there, or the, the middle part, divide that. Plague. Mm, not a very nice word, but Python comes after plague. So take this half you've got here, or this little bit you've got here, divide that in half. Uh, pugnacious, awesome word, but not yet up to Python. Take this remaining part, divide that in half. Razor bill. I don't even know what that is, but um, divide that remaining part in half. Rack, no, that's not enough. Divide that in half. Qualify, no, that's not enough. Divide that remaining part in half. You know Python's coming up. Purser, no. And finally, the remaining page, you get Python, which is a large tropical constricting snake. Now, that sort of algorithm, which takes eight or nine steps, versus her brother, who's taking 30 or 40,000, depending on how many words are in the dictionary, are completely different. And of course, we're aiming for the speedy, efficient algorithms. Now, how do you implement that? Actually, it's very similar base code to what you've developed in problem two, but there are three main differences. First, that guess that you're going to be making. It's not a simple guess of step by step by step, but rather you're going to have a good guess of a lower bound and an upper bound. You're going to divide those by two. The problem specification is really good for this, giving you suggestions about what your lower bound and your upper bound might be. So you take upper and lower bounds, divide that by two. You run through your loop one time. If your guess was too high, then you have to adjust that upper bound that you're using, your upper guess. You're going to bring that down to whatever your your guess was. If you were too low, you're going to adjust that lower bound that you had to whatever your guess was. And that is going to just zoom right in on the answer. But it's not just better guesses that you're going to have to implement. You're also going to have to think about how you're going to deal with the floating point numbers that are coming up here. We're not dealing with just dollars anymore. It's dollars and cents. And we're supposed to be within one cent of the correct answer. And if you remember from the lecture in which professor was looking at floating points through square roots or cube roots, I believe, he was using something called epsilon, an approximation. You're not going to get exactly to where your remaining balance after 12 months is zero, exactly zero. But you might get to be within a cent. So if you let this epsilon be one cent, and if you get within that, you're done. That's the problem specification tells you that. Now, how do you do that? Well, obviously you can look through the problem sets that we've seen, not the problem sets, but the lectures, and there's some very good hints in that. There's one more thing though, a third part that I think is very important, and a lot of people were missing, and that's why there was a lot of loops, that 397 error I think it is. And that is that, let's take an extreme case where the first guess is a million dollars, is the minimum monthly payment. You pay a million dollars, your original balance, let's say, was only 5000 You paid it off in the first month, but you keep paying a million dollars 12 more times. If you don't design your code properly, the value of like minus $12 million or $1 million per month would be the output of your code that says that is the minimum monthly payment. Now, obviously, you've gone way too far in that case. And the key here is to understand you need to think in terms of absolute value vis-a-vis -vis that epsilon. So if you're way too far south of the answer, that's bad too. So you're going to have to incorporate absolute values also into this code. So there's a lot to do here. If you have questions, let us know. But hopefully you're getting excited about computer science with this one. You know, it's, it's like some alien movie. Let's say Sigourney Weaver, she's on a spaceship. And the aliens are not... We're coming after you, step by step, Sigourney. Be careful, here we come. They might get her, but that's ah, not so exciting. Those aliens, they just see and they get you. And that's what this binary search does. And that's what makes computer science and these beautifully designed algorithms so exciting. A lot more coming your way. Hang in there. See you next week.